And then you come across an obituary that really gets to you. All of them get to me, but especially there's your son that really gets to me worse than others. I, I read one yesterday. I want to share it with you if I can get through it. The Pillsbury Doughboy died yesterday of a severe yeast infection. <laughs> And complications of repeatedly being poked in the belly. The trauma. He was 71. Doughboy was buried in a lightly greased coffin. <laughs> Dozens of celebrities turned out to pay their respects, including Mrs. Buzzworth, Hunger Jack, the California Raisins, Betty Crocker, the hostess Twinkies, and Captain Crunch. The great site was piled high with flowers. F-L-O-U-R-S. <laughs> Aunt Jemima delivered the eulogy and lovingly described the dope boy as a man who never knew how much he was needed. K N E A. The dope boy rose quickly in show business, but later his life was filled with turnovers. <laughs> he, was, <laughs> he was not considered a very smart cookie, wasting much of his dough on half baked schemes. Despite being a little flaky at times, he still, as a crusty old man, was considered a role model <coughs> for millions. Doughboy is survived by his wife, Play-Doh. <laughs> Two children, John Doe and Jane Doe, plus his, his dog, Dozy Doe. <laughs> plus they had one in the oven. for about 20 minutes. <laughs> okay, now, 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 now we're going to get serious again. Usually you can tell how serious the, the sermon's going to be by how cracked up the joke is beforehand, so we're getting ready. Kyle Johnson. Get your Bibles out and turn to Judges chapter 6. Judges chapter 6. I actually had planned to do something entirely different, but the Lord just started dealing with me. And even, I already had the sermon pretty well laid out. And again, like yesterday, the Lord still kept dealing with me. So this is just the introduction. We'll go back into it after, uh, after well, I was going to say next week, but next week we have uh, Jesus for Jesus, so the following week. Joshua chapter 6. How many here feel like you just aren't good enough? I mean, the judges. Just keep y'all keeping y'all honest. Judges chapter six. I mean, here's ever felt inadequate to work for God. You don't have to raise your hands. You can just speak it to your heart. How many ever felt inadequate to work for God? How many ever felt like you just didn't measure up? Well, this is what happened with, with Gideon, one of the greatest judges in the history of Israel. And we're going to talk about him. Matter of fact, the name of the sermon is going to be Lessons from the Life of Gideon. But, but to start with, this is just our introduction. Y'all stand for the reading of the word. Judges chapter 6. You got your Bible say amen? You don't say with me? Judges chapter 6 verse 1. And the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord. Let me just stop right there for just a second. Doing evil in the sight of the Lord doesn't mean necessarily that you're in the bars and you're shooting up drugs and, and, and you're selling stuff on the street. No, what it means is all of that's included. There's a lot of Christians that do evil in the sight of the Lord because the word evil literally means doing it your way. Not does it mean, not does it have the connotation of doing the rough stuff, but it also means doing it your way. Has anybody in here ever done it your way? Amen? That's right. That's right. So, here we go. Matter of fact, I call that a Burger King religion. We do it our way. <laughs> Amen? So, the children of Israel did evil in the sight of the Lord, and the Lord delivered them into 
into the hand of Midian seven years. Now, seven is a significant number, which means uh, completeness. It means to be total. It means to be through and through. And so these guys, God didn't just say, okay, I'm going to let you get a little whack on the hand. We're going to look. I, I, you've been playing around too much. Now, we're going to go ahead and we're going to hit it hard, okay? So, complete. And the hand of Midian prevailed against Israel. And because of the Midianites, the children of Israel made them uh, dens which are in the mountains and in caves and strongholds. So they're not even staying in their own homes anymore. They've dug out holes in the, in the mountains trying to stay and stay away from the enemy. And so it was when Israel had sown that the Midianites came up and the Amalekites and the children of the east, even they came up against them and they encamped against him and destroyed the increase of the earth till thou come into Gaza and left no sustenance for Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor ass. In other words, everything that they were going to use to, to build up the place, even to just sustain life, was being taken away. For they came up with their cattle and their tents, and they came as grasshoppers for the multitude. For both they and their camels were without number. Can you imagine the enemy coming against you without number? You can't even tell. So much is coming against you. You can't even, can't even figure out where they're all coming from and why so many is coming against you. And they entered into the land to destroy it. And Israel was greatly impoverished because of the Midianites. And the children of Israel cried unto the Lord. And it came to pass when the children of Israel cried unto the Lord because of the Midianites, that the Lord sent a prophet unto the children of Israel, which said unto them, Thus saith the Lord God of Israel, I brought you up out of Egypt and brought you forth out of the house of bondage and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians and out of the hand of all the oppressed you and drove them out from before you and gave you their land. And I said unto you, I am the Lord your God, fear not the gods of the Amorites with whom thou wet land you dwell, but you have not obeyed my voice. And there came an angel of the Lord and sat under an oak which was an Oprah that pertained unto Joash, the Abazirite, and his son Gideon, Thresh wheat by the wine press to hide it from the Midianites. So we're talking about a mighty champion who's actually hid right now. He's doing his stuff, but he's got it hid. He's way out of sight. He doesn't even want anybody to see where he's at to know where he's at. Does this sound like a very mighty man? Does this sound like a powerful man? Does this sound like a man that's got his act together? No, it sounds like he's scared to death. And the angel of the Lord appeared unto him and said unto him, The Lord is with thee, thy mighty man. Whoa. Whoa. Oh, I forgot to put up the PowerPoint, too. It got good. I could do this for prayer. Put the PowerPoint up. <coughs> the mighty man of valor. In other words, you mighty, courageous, or fearless warrior. Now remember, he's hiding. He's scared to death. And God comes up and says, you man, you, you warrior of fearless courage. See, God sees things different than we do, amen? He said, and Gideon said unto him, O oh my Lord, if the Lord be with us, why then has all this befallen us? And where be all his miracles which our fathers did tell us of? Saying, did not the Lord bring us up from Egypt? But now the Lord hath forsaken us and delivered us into the hands of the Midianites. And the Lord looked unto him and said, Go in this thy might. And thou shalt save Israel from the hand of the Midianites, have not I sent thee? And he said unto him, O my Lord, where is shall I save Israel? Here we go. Y'all got to pay close attention to this verse, because here's what we're going to focus on today. How shall I save Israel? How can I work for you, Lord? How can you possibly want me to go out and tell somebody about you? How can I defend folks for you? Because my family is poor in Manasseh, and I am the least. In my father's house. And the Lord said unto him, Surely I will be with thee, and thou shalt smite the Midians as one man. Let's pray. Father, I love you, Lord. I praise your name. I thank you for your grace. I thank you for your mercy. I know, God, you're alive and well on the throne, Father. And I know, God, that whatever we ask, any time we ask, you are able to do it. And we trust you with it, Lord. I ask you right now, Lord, to touch each person here, minister to them, and through them in a very powerful in special way. I ask you right now, Lord, to help us focus on your word and to know that your word is powerful, it is complete, and it will do what it was sent to do. I ask you right now, Father, touch us all. Help us, God, to know, God, that you are in control, totally, 
100%. And Lord, help us when we leave this place, Lord, fill a fresh anointing upon us. In the name of Jesus, we pray. And the church said, Amen. Amen, amen, amen. Make somebody give a high five, low five, low five, and say, Hey, it's good to be in God's house. There's a few of you got to give them four and a half, but that's okay. Okay, that's where we start, right there. Lessons from Gideon. Lessons from Gideon. Now watch this now. There's already conflict going because Gideon's seeing things one way and God's seeing things another. Gideon's got his ideas of how to handle it. God's got his ideas of how to handle it. Some of y'all in here right now. You've got all your problems figured out. How many here have got everything figured out? You know what I'll see? I'll see a lot of people that know all the answers. The problem is they don't know the questions. Amen. Y'all get that in a minute. Here we go. Gideon, of course, uh, Gideon is he's a mighty example of how God can take, watch this now, how God can take a nobody. When I say nobody, I'm not talking about everybody else or reckon everybody else around their thought so too at the time. But how God can take a nobody, and I'm talking about in his own sight, how God can take a nobody. Watch this, which means literally he had an inferiority complex. Anybody in here ever had an inferiority complex? Meaning you don't think you're good enough, you don't think you ever measure up, you don't think that you can handle what's coming at you. You have a problem all the time thinking you just don't measure up. An inferiority complex, he was on the run, which meant he was, he was uh, led by fear, and he was hid, which means he had a victim mentality. Wow. Do you know anybody like that? They have an inferiority complex. They're always being led by fear. Let their fear do the talking. And they find themselves hiding from others and hiding from the situation, which means literally the person may have a victim mentality. So, <coughs> so in this story, we're going to watch how God turns him around <coughs> and uses this man with an inferiority complex led by fear and with a victim mentality. He's going to turn him around and use him for this situation. So, so let's just watch a little bit now. Look, let's just see what Gideon's looking at. Until the angel came, let's just see what Gideon's looking at. All Gideon could see was, is the city was under attack. It said without number. No matter what they did, no matter how they did their stuff, no matter how they prepared to just for life itself, just for life. They weren't prepared for battle. They didn't even have enough to prepare for life, much less battle. They were so scared they were hiding in the hills. They were digging out holes. They were finding ways to get under the rocks. They were trying to stay out of these people's way. And so in the middle of all this, for seven years, it seemed like God was silent. And have you ever been under attack? You ain't got to raise your hand. Hey, have you ever been under attack? You know Satan's coming at you with everything he's got. He's hitting you on your job. He's hitting you with your family. He's hitting you in your own personal life. And while all of this is going on, in your eyes, it looks like God is silent. Now, now you can raise your hand if you want to. Have you ever been there? I have. You see it coming from every direction. It's hitting you every way you turn. You not even you can't even get enough breath in you to fight. You're too busy trying just to sustain life, and you can't even do that because the enemy is hitting you so hard. And then you wonder where's God? Why don't I hear Him? And so it's in these situations if you're not careful when you are not hearing from God, you start depending on self, your own wisdom, your own understanding, your own power. And so that's what he did. He, depending on himself, he ran and he hid. <laughs> Let me ask you a question. Sound familiar? Have you ever been there? I mean, you thought you had to get it. You found out you didn't. You thought this was, you had everything figured out. You found out everything you figured out was all wrong. You thought you had it all. You had the, you had the ring. You ready to grab the ring, uh, the golden ring, and the golden ring snatched away, and all you got is fear hitting you, and you're trying your best to to think and to focus and you can't focus and you can't even focus on God because you're being hit so hard you're not sure where to turn. And it's in these times that as we begin to focus on the battle and lose our focus on God we start hearing less from God. It's not that he's not talking. It's not that he's not watching. He's 
omniscient. He's omnipresent. He's omnipotent. He's all powerful. He's all knowing. And he's everywhere at all times. So if he's there, there's times though that he has his unknown presence with you. And there's times that he has his revealed presence with you. Now his unknown presence is with you all the time. Somebody say all the time. Whether you believe it or not, whether you feel it or not, his unknown presence, unrevealed presence, is with you all the time. But his revealed presence can come and go. It can come and go depending on the situation. It can come and go depending on what God's trying to teach you. And it can come and go depending on if you're actually trying to see him or not or trying to hear from him because we see what we're prepared to see. We hear what we're prepared to hear. And so here he is. He doesn't see God. He doesn't see God in any of this, although he's God's person, and he's one of God's people, and he's here trying to make ends spiritually, so to speak, make ends meet. And he's here because he's taken it in his own power. And in his own power, he has nothing. Somebody say nothing. nothing. He has nothing to come against this multitude beyond counting. Wow. That's some powerful stuff. So now, I kept reading this and reading this and reading this and this is where I stopped because I was actually going to hit you in some lessons about Gideon and the Lord just wouldn't let me stop. He just kept pushing it, pushing it, pushing it. So I just started writing. Now, 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 now when we look at this picture now, you know, how many know fear can be passed down? Sometimes I see people that are, 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 are very fearful, people who are always seeming to be under the gun, people with negative attitudes, and not always, but many times, I can trace it back, and I can see where maybe their parents or somebody they really were connected with had that same attitude. Oh, at the time you didn't think it was bad. But now that you need God to move in your life, and at that time you need to break away from that pattern, the pattern's already established in your life. And because the pattern's already established in your life, unless you realize that, and unless you know how to get out of that pattern, you're going to be in a holding pattern for quite some time. So it is with fear. See, 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 here it is. Inferiority, inferiority complex? Yes, he had an inferiority complex. He said, but Lord God, but Lord... Uh, Gideon replied, how can I rescue Israel? I, I, got another, I, I broke it down into the Hebrew so you can really kind of see it in a different light here. My clan is the weakest in the whole tribe of Manasseh. In other words, Manasseh itself ain't so hot. It's only half a tribe. So I'm in a weak tribe and my family is the weakest of the whole tribe. And then just to make matters worse, I'm the least in my family. Huh. I know none of us have ever thought anything like that. Can you imagine? God's coming to a man who thinks he's not just low. He's the lowest of the lowest of the lowest. Have you ever felt like you were about as low as you could possibly go? Have you ever felt like, God, if it gets any worse, I don't know what we're going to do. God, if things don't change, I just don't know. And you're in that pattern. And so when you're in that pattern, here's what happens. Everything that is good is brought down low. So no matter how good it is, it seems extremely low. And in this same pattern, no matter how small the bad is, it's always exploded. So on a scale of 1 to 10, a good thing that could be a 10 in your eyes is a 1. And the bad that you see is actually a 1. You've already got it past a 10 because you're in that pattern. That pattern has, has encompassed your mind. It's encompassed your heart. It has sucked you in. It is holding you down. It's got its thumb on you. And Satan is the one with the thumb. And he says, I like God's people with an inferiority complex because now they don't realize just how much power is within them, how much power is available to them, and how much they can do for God because with God nothing's impossible. But as long as they've got this pattern in their life, I can take my thumb and I can hold them down and I can keep them down at my will. I don't like being a victim. Matter of fact, I don't like being the target. If Satan's going to hit me, it's going to be a moving target. 
Amen. Okay, so watch this. When you live by fear, you will be led by fear, and you will leave others your fear. You'll pass it on. One more time. When you live by fear, you say, well, I don't walk around going, woo, all the time. No, but if you go, you know, I see it. Here's some of your sayings. And this is some of your sayings. You might want to check yourself. It'll never work. We tried this way before. Just leave well enough alone. I know it hurts, but I'd rather hurt. You know, it's okay. I've hurt before. It's all right. Well, I'll just go ahead and cover my head. You go ahead. I know it might work for you, but it'll never work for me. You are being led by fear. God says perfect love, his love, agape, casteth out what? All fear. So when you're being led by fear, all of a sudden now you stop short. Of, look, here's your goal, you'll stop short. Here's another goal, you'll stop short. Another goal, you'll stop short because you're being led by fear and as soon as it gets tough, You get running. So, so watch this. I'm gonna, I, I don't have a whole lot today. Of course, every time I say that, I preach for an hour and a half, so get ready. <laughs> so watch this now. <laughs> you ever ask that question? Where are you, God? I'm hurt. Where you at? God, this ain't working like I was thinking it was going to work. This is not what I had in mind, God. When I said yes to you, I was expecting something a whole lot different. When, when, when I turned my back on the world and turned my eyes to you, I thought everything was going to be hunky-dory. One thing the Lord showed me, and I want you to remember this. Of course, you know this. If all you ever have is sunshine, you know what you get? A desert. And life is a mixture of sunshine and rain. It's a, one side of the coin is sunshine, the other side of the coin is rain. Let me tell you something. If you have a coin with only one side, it's useless. If you have a coin, a coin with only one side, it's valuable, valueless. But if you have a coin with both sides on it, then guess what's going to happen? You got something there. You got something valuable, something powerful. So, so yes, there's sunshine. And yes, there's rain. But there's a time when you're hurting and you don't necessarily think about, well, oh, okay, here's the other side of the coin. Okay, all sunshine is nothing, all sunshine is nothing but the desert. You don't think about that because you're hurting. And so as you hurt, especially, now let me just tell you something. Sometimes we suffer from inferiority complexes. Sometimes we just suffer from a fear complex. But then there's other times where we're just going through things at the time that already have our nerves on end. It could be a grief cycle. It could be something on your job. It could be a problem that you're having with your marriage, so whatever. So you're already tender. And so because you're tender, you don't necessarily have to have that inferiority complex or in that fear pattern. But still, you begin to wonder, is God ever going to work for me? Is God going to ever come back up? Is God ever going to show himself strong again in my life? So, so, so watch this. Here's what he saw. They were under attack. looked like God was silent. And he was depending on himself. And as he depended on himself, he said, Whoa, I can't fight all this. I'm going to run. What Gideon could not see is that God was not silent. God was watching the whole time. God was paying attention. And here's, here's actually going to be the lead in the next week, but I just want you to want you to watch something here. Watch it carefully. Look at this. Watch it. Read it. Let's read it out loud. When tough times come, instead of looking at them as if God is punishing you, try to see them as God's gift of grace. Wow. That's a slap in the mouth, isn't it? When tough times come, instead of looking at them as if God's punishing you, Try to see them as God's gift of grace. It's not happening to you, it's happening for you.
because if it was happening to you, then you would have no choice but to, but to fight a no-ending battle. But if it's like happening for you, God is using it to strengthen you, to, in, 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 to, to, to give you more wisdom, more understanding, to show you how to handle things, to put you in a position where you can minister to other people like you never could before. So, so watch this now. And I am, I am getting ready to close. That don't mean anything, but okay. The first thing God was going to do is help Gideon break the pattern. How many want to be used by God? You know, it might not be fear, it could be other things. But more than likely, if you've got two Christians anywhere, one or two of them have some kind of negative pattern in your life. My fact, usually it's like 100%. we got some kind of negative pattern in our life. It could be because times have been hard, things have been rough, you've been in some battles, had some misunderstandings, whatever. But we have to let God, we have to allow God to break the pattern, that defeating pattern in our life. So that's now watch this. It, 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 I'm, I'm getting close to the end now. I love this. <laughs> Scared? When the boogeyman goes to sleep, every night he checks his closet for Chuck Norris. <laughs> <laughs> Matter of fact, Superman has it wears a set of Chuck Norris underwear. <laughs> Are ready? Be aware that living in a state of fear is not God's plan for you. I had somebody tell me just recently, they said, you know, I knew you when you were younger. I knew you when you were, you would, you would really put it on me. I'm telling you, 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 you might hurt somebody. They said, you snapped easy and you, you attacked. And said, I've noticed that's kind of gone. They said, you're more laid back about things and you handle things differently. And I don't know whether they were trying to insult me or what. I just looked at them and said, thank you. Because I know that a lot of times when you attack back it's because you're living in a state of fear. And because that fear makes you want to attack back instead of waiting for God to attack for you. Or to tell you what to do. So it says, in God I trust, I will not be afraid. What can mortal man do to me? Psalm 56 and 4. So watch this now. I'm going to show you fear-based thinking. I want you to think about it. First, it suggests that you may not be fully trusting God. Fear-based thinking uh, does not appropriate the grace of God. Already? Fear-based thinking keeps you in bondage to fear. It is physically, emotionally, spiritually damaging, spiritually draining. You walk around looking for something around every you know, that's one of the bad things about PTSD. I realized, you know, uh, with PTSD, of course, we all, all of us have some, some touch of it somewhere if you've ever been through anything. Number one thing, of course, was car wrecks. And I thought about that thing after we had to hit on collision. Those guys got killed. People behind me got their backs all messed up. I was in the middle, crushed like an accordion. And I walked away. My body was bruised, but God miraculously delivered me because the state trauma said, you should be dead, son. I said, you know, I'm sorry I disappointed you. Bethany, bless her heart, had just got her purgate. And nobody would drive with her. You have to understand Bethany's driving. And so Jimmy said, I'll drive with you, Bethany. So Jimmy drives with Bethany a little bit, and then I get another car. Now remember, I just had a hit on collision. I really hadn't had a big experience, I don't think, in PTSD until I hit that car head on. Because now, 
Every time I'm riding in traffic, I see a car get in my lane, my heart just goes, and I'm having a hard time. So, so I'm riding with Bethany, and I'm going to tell you what, that won't make you face your fears. I finally asked her one day, I said, why do you keep riding that white line? She said, Mr. Jimmy told me to. I said, do I look like Mr. Jimmy? Back in the middle of the lane, please, because they were building 17. That was, took two years to make that little bitty shop between Chocolate and Possum Track. And so uh, one night we're coming along and Bethany goes off the road, tears up my car, tears up my hub because she runs off of the road because she's riding the white line. She runs off the road, runs in a pothole, tears my car up where I get some stuff done to it. And I said, girl, you got to quit this. But one day, one day we're going, I should have told this in her funeral, one day we're riding on Highway 17 and this little Hispanic guy standing here, you understand why I say Hispanic guy? He's standing here with a stop sign and a flag. And he goes, and we're coming up. I said, Bethany, stop. And she keeps on going. I said, Bethany, stop. And she keeps on going. That little man started doing like this. <laughs> then he threw down the sign and started doing like this. <laughs> then he started threw down the sign of it. <laughs> I told Bethany one day, I said, Bethany, I said, you see that guy? I said, well, I said, Bethany, it's snowing and it's raining and it's so cold. There was a man hitchhiking about to freeze down. He saw you come and put his hand in his pocket and started walking. <laughs> so I remember that PTSD experience. <laughs> but I honestly, and I'm just going to throw it out there because it helps all of us. To know these things, it's good for all of us to hear this stuff because you know it happens to everybody. Uh, the other day, I had to go to the emergency room. To go to the emergency room, I had to walk through the back door and walk down the back steps. And so I walk out the back door and walk down the back steps. So all I can see is Bethany laying there. So the last place she was ever in our house before she was taken to the hospital and never came back. Again. She's on that ground and she's crying where she fell. I remember going out there and filling up her head and checking her out and getting her up and getting her to the hospital. I took her to the emergency room. The emergency room had just been rebuilt in Washington. Our very first experience. I'm there. I have no idea where I'm at. The moment I know the emergency room in the back of my hand, now I don't. I get her in there and we get her back and back and they're taking us places and I don't know where I'm going. And I see Bethany. I see her acting different and acting strange. And I said, something's not going on. It's not going right here. And they told me she had a brain bleed. Of course, it was cancer going to the brain. And so I saw this stuff going on. And then I remember they said, we got Denise Carey here and take her to Greenville. And then we took her to Greenville and that started just a downhill slope. We thought she was getting better and downhill slope. And so I go in the emergency room the other night. And as soon as I go in the emergency room, my heart starts going. And I said, what is wrong? And I said, I need y'all to take me back here to see Brother Billy, as I'm going back there, all of a sudden, and my knees got kind of weak. And I said, what is going on? I said, I'm not afraid of this place. I'm not afraid of Brother Billy. And then all I can see is Bethany's face. And I had to stop and admit to myself, honey, not honey, that's what my wife was saying, honey. I said, David, you have to admit You've got PTSD. And it's showing itself. Now you know what to do. Do it. And I found myself wanting to turn around and run. And I said, no, that's not how you fix this. You have to face it. You have to move forward. You have to move in it. Move in it with the correct attitude. And move in with the correct procedures. And so I moved in. And I stayed there. And I stayed there as long as I needed to stay. And I come home. And when I went out and got in my car... I had to wipe the tears from my eyes, and all I can think about is, last time I was in here, Bethany was dying. And again, when I went home, the minister said, you okay? Yeah, I'm fine. I'm fine. Well, see, we all have those moments. But if you don't be careful, what you're going to do is, 
You're going to find yourself not fully trusting God. You will not appropriate the grace of God. You will keep you in bondage to this. And you'll be physically, emotionally, spiritually drained and damaged. So here are some things I did that night. And it very much helped. Of course, look at this. You know the phrase, do not be afraid, is written in the Bible 365 times. Did you know that? That means that there's a different fear not for every day of the year. Why? Fear not. Watch this. Begin with help your fear, the awe of God. The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom, but fools despise wisdom and discipline. Now, now again, this is what I was doing as I was sitting in the emergency room and as, as I was going back out and as I went back home that night and I laid down and I, and I, couldn't, I couldn't do my homework. I just had to, I had to do this. Watch this. I want y'all to say this with me. Each one, okay? Ready? You have to believe that God, watch this. I want you to say you, say me. I want y'all to say me. Created me because he loves me. Y'all say that again. God created me because he loves me. God has a purpose and a plan for me. Y'all say that. God has a purpose and a plan for me. God has the right, right, to have authority over me. God wants me to trust him with my life. Say it. God wants me to trust him with my life. God has the power for me to change. I'll say that. God has the power for me to change. God will keep me safe as long as I trust Him. God will keep me safe as long as I trust Him. Now, you have a choice in life. You can be led by fear. You can have, you can be in a negative fear pattern. You can be in that fear pattern. You can be in that negative holding pattern. You can. You can be tied up in an inferiority complex. You can be tied up in grief, whatever. But it's a choice you have. Instead of replaying all this bad stuff and all this bad stuff and all this bad stuff, uh, with PTSD, find you a safe place. When I say safe place, I want you to, next time, if you had a car wreck or something's going and there's a PTSD uh, going on in you, I want you to sit back and I want you to stop and I want you to think about where you were at before the bad thing happened. Think of something good that happened before the bad happened. Think of something good before the bad. Maybe you're on the way to a party, you're having fun, and some guy pulls over. I was going to a wedding when the guy pulled over my side of the road and hit me. Okay? So the wedding, preparation for the wedding, it was fun, it was, we were having a good time, we were laughing, we were joking. You can take yourself back to that time, and then, then remind, remind yourself, God knew what was coming, we didn't. And God already prepared you for what was coming. And God prepared you for what after was coming. And if you go back to that and think about that, that honestly will help you as you're trying to deal with the pain. So watch. Matter of fact, if y'all want, I can make some copies of this. Here's what I want you to start telling yourself. God created me. Y'all say it again. Say it again one more time. God with me. God created me because he loves me. Say it. God has a purpose and a plan for me. God has a purpose and a plan for me. God has the right to have authority over me. God has the right to have authority over me. God wants me to trust my life to Him. God wants you to trust my life to Him. God has the power to change me. God has the power to change me. God will keep me safe as long as I trust Him. God will keep me safe as long as I trust Him. Amen. Amen. Now. Remember that old guy hiding? <laughs> y'all don't know. Y'all that do not know the story, again, you want to come back week after next. Come back next week too. Uh, while we serve barbecue to that Jew, <laughs> y'all got to understand he loves barbecue. I carried him into Smithfield Chicken Barbecue, and a lady came to our table, and I said, "I said I want you to do this guy right." She said, "Why?" I said. Is it a ribeye? I said, no, a ribeye. <laughs> I said, he's in here. Nobody knows he's around the chicken in the barbecue. I said, and it's National Rabbi Day. 
She said, really? I didn't know that was on my calendar. I had to check that out. I said, yeah. I said, so how about Lotus played up with good old barbecue? And she said, can you have it? I said, it don't matter. Don't tell anybody he's a rabbi. That rascal ate and ate and ate. One of them can send me some Smithfield chicken and barbecue all over wherever he's at. Send me some. He loves it. So on the way there, when we find out where we're coming, I said, I can't wait for you to come. He says, yeah, it could be National Rabbi Day. So now, you went from hiding to doing something great. Watch this. God was about to totally change Gideon's world. How many could use the thought of God totally changing your world? Could do yours too if you let him. DC, come on up here. Next time you find yourself faced with an inferiority complex or fear pattern or other kind of negative patterns, instead of feeding it with negative, feed your spirit with positive. Feed your spirit with good stuff. With what God is doing for you. He created you because He loves you. He has purpose and a plan for your life. And quitting and, 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 and being defeated is not part of it. He has the right to have authority over you. So maybe you're in a bad spot now, but He's there and He's watching. He's got it. And He wants you to trust Him. He, will, and he, will have, he has the power to change you and He will keep you safe as long as you trust Him. Everybody, please stand. Head bowed, every eye closed, nobody looking around. I can tell you, some of you are here today at a crossroads. You're trying to decide whether to even keep giving God a chance because it doesn't seem like it's doing too good. You even begin to think that the battle's not even worth fighting anymore. Just go give me in. You don't have the strength. You don't have the power. You don't have the authority. You just want to run and hide. Can't do it. God's got something better for you. And all this stuff you're going through is preparation for what God's fixing to do. Every head bowed, every eye closed. If you're here right now, and you can say, yes, Pastor, I, I, I have a problem with inferiority, or I have a problem with fear, or I seem to be locked into a pattern of fear, and it seems to take me down at every opportunity, it holds me down, and I just want to be free of that. While nobody's looking, while nobody's got their eyes open, you're all got your heads bowed. If that's you, but you put it back in and say, that's me. I, I've got fear. I'm in that fear pattern. I, I need God to help me. Maybe you're here today. hit you hard. You're not sure exactly how to handle it. And so instead of engaging, you sit back and wait. You hear God saying it's going to be okay. You hear God saying everything's going to be fine. Or maybe you don't hear God at all. But you need God to show you that one more time that it's going to be okay. To show you one more time that he's got this. To show you one more time that he's got it handled. If I'm talking to you, you don't have to keep him up. Keep your head bowed. Keep your eyes closed. But you put that hand up so I can pray for you. Touch them all right now in the name of Jesus. Touch them. Let them know that you've got this. Let them know that 
this fear is not from you. Let them know that that power that is trying to take them down is nowhere, no way is compared to the power that can lift them up. God has power. God has a plan. Gideon said, I can't do this, God. <laughs> Look at me. I'm running like a chicken. I'm hiding. I'm from the smallest tribe. I'm from a family that's the smallest family. And I'm the weakest of all of them. You can't get any lower than I am. Look how sorry I am in my own eyes. And God says, come on, mighty man. You mighty warrior of fearless courage. I'm getting ready to rock your world. I'm getting ready to show you something you have, you have only dreamed about. Yes, life has hit you hard. And yes, life has come against you. And yes, it seems like everything you held dear was taken away. But I'm going to show you something. If you hold on, I'm going to show you something that the world can never even imagine. You're going to rise up way beyond not only your expectations, but everybody else's. And together, you and God are going to rock your world. Ask David, little 17-year-old boy, up against a giant twice his size. He literally rocked his world with a sling and a stone. I want everybody to repeat after me. God, I give, myself, I give myself, my life, my, life, my, marriage, my marriage, my family, my job, my job me, me to you. I refuse, I refuse to be led by, held down by, abused by the spirit of fear. For I know you have not given this. I will stand. Firm on your word, on your promise, in faith, believe it, it's going to work out. Help me, God, to rid myself of the neg negative thought patterns, the negative feelings, the hopelessness talk. Help me, God, to start speaking life. And trust you to help me. I know it won't be easy, but it'll be worth it. I trust you today in the name of Jesus. Thank you, Lord. You Lord, have to have a pray. When the Bible says fear hath torment, it means literally fear will beat you. Fear is a bully. Fear will consume you. Fear will obstruct you. Fear will mutilate you. Don't let it. Through Jesus Christ, we can do all things. I don't have it on now, but I got that one that says, God's got this. Every time I put them on, I get somewhere and somebody says, Oh, Tell me about Bethany. How's she doing? I tried to, and my wife says, you got to find a better way to tell them. I said, she died. And she goes, can you find a better way to say it? I said, well, how can you say it any better? She died. She said, but do you see the reaction of the people when you tell them about it? I said, well, I didn't feel too good about it either. And I wasn't giving all my stuff away. There's one lady who was crying in the mass meeting the other night. She was her table leader. And she said she loved Bethany so much. And she said, she remember Bethany saying, God's got this. And I had God got this on my arm. So I took it off. And all I got now is a team Bethany, but that's fine. I look down here and all I can think of is her saying to me all the time, chill, Dad. God's got this. Chill, Dad. God's got this. God's got this. God's got this. Someone say, God's got this. God's got this. Right now, the altars are open. If you have any need from God, you can come on up here. It's only 
10 minutes to 12. We've got plenty of time. You want to pray? Come on up here and pray. You got any need in your life? Come on up. Remember, next week we're going to have Jews for Jesus, but then the following week I'm going to talk about how God turned getting his life around from that inferiority complex to power and authority. If I have a special need, you're welcome to come to the altar. God's awesome. All the time. God's awesome. Look at somebody and tell them, God's got this. Look at somebody and tell them, God's got this. Amen.